sitting. It says, for the believer, who is going to be blessed? The man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. There is a way for you to walk. Who is the person that will be blessed? The man that does not stand in the way of sinners. There is a way to stand. Who will be blessed? The man that does not sit in the seat of the scornful. So this month, we're going to be looking at the believer's walk, the believer's sitting, and the believer's standing. And it's going to be awesome. This morning, we look at the first one, the believer's walking, the believer's walk. The believer's walk. So, like I said, the believer's life is likened to a walk. And we have read in that passage, the believer must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. There is a way to walk. For he says, you must never walk in the counsel of the ungodly. What does that mean? Later, we're going to see a little bit of that. Rather, we are to walk in Christ's law, in Christ's light, in Christ's law. There is a way to walk. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but walk in the love of Christ. Walk in the light of Christ. Walk in the law of Christ. There is a way to walk. God expects us. Look at Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Let me show you something. The way God expects you to walk. I said, believer, you know, there are bad people in the world. God says, don't walk in the way of bad men. Don't walk in the way of bad women. Don't be somebody that is uh, always seducing the opposite sex and making them to fall. That's the way of bad women. Look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20. It says, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. That's how the believer is to walk. Walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. When a man who is married but is having an affair with another woman and is telling you and say, my brother, how can you stay with one woman? All these ones is sweet, though. you don't understand. All these other ones, come and try it. My brother, the Bible says, don't walk in the way of that bad man. Walk in the way of good men. You know the way of good men? They are married. They keep to their wife. They don't have extramarital affairs. Their eyes are not on other women. That's a good man. They are faithful to the marriage covenant that they made. That's a good man. And for you that are students, walk in the way of good boys. Good boys don't have girlfriends. Good boys don't mess around. For you that are girls, walk in the way of good girls. Good girls are not messing around. Good girls are not exposing their bodies to lure, you know, boys today. Walk in the way, verse 20, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. That's the way you must walk, the path of righteousness. If you go into sin, that's the way of good of bad men. That's the way of bad, bad boys. That's the way of bad girls. But the Bible says, keep the path of the righteous. You must use today's message to evaluate your Christian life, to examine your spiritual work, is it up to scratch? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you really in line with God's purpose? I pray that you will be so in Jesus' name. That you will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but rather you will walk in the way of good men. You will walk in the way of good women. And the Lord will bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. How is a believer to walk? Because we are talking about the believer's walk. Yes, you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but then how do you walk? We have been told how not to walk. 
don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But now we are going to be told how to walk. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. And walk in love. That's how the Bible says you should walk. And walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling favor and walk in love. Why are we to walk in love? First John chapter 4. When the Bible says walk in love, why is the Bible compelling you? To walk in love. First John, let's read from I mean, chapter 4. First John chapter 4. Let me read to you from verse 7. First John chapter 4 from verse 7. It tells us, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. That's why you are told to walk in love. Love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. You are saying, Pastor, I love God. Then he says, You also, I'm born of God. I'm born again. Then you will love. I know God. Then you will love. I am of God. Then you will love. Because love is of God. And everyone, no exception. Everyone that is, I mean, that love it is born of God. If you are born of God, you will love. And everyone that knoweth God loves. If you know God, you will love. That's why the Bible says, walk in love. There is no other way the believer can walk. In verse 8, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Love is not only of God, the Bible says, even the character, the complete entity of God is love. It's not only that God emanates, I mean, love emanates from God, but God himself is love. In verse 8, it says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. He says, if you don't love, you don't, you may say you don't know God, but he says you don't know God. Because you cannot be of God and not love, because God is love personified. Verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that he might live through him. That's how God showed his love to us, sending Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. Verse 10, hearing his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So even when we didn't love God, he loved us anyway. And he took the steps of love to make atonement for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. That's why the Bible says walk in love. God has so loved you, and the only thing he wants is for you to manifest that character of love, for you to manifest that nature of love. If you know God, then you manifest the nature of God, his love. If you know God, then you will, you will live like God lives. He loved the world again. You will love and you will give. You will love, you will give of your time to help those who need your help. You will know. You will give of your of your resources to those who are needy. That's love. God so loved, He gave. And the Bible says, "Walk in love. Walk in love." God is love, and He has manifested His love towards us. He sent His Son to die on Calvary for us. God is the one that has shared His love abroad in our heart. Do you know why you can love? Romans chapter 5. If God left you just the way you are, you cannot love. In fact, the things that man does, people will do to you, will make you not to even love. But you don't know the reason why we love? Because our hearts are saturated with God's love. Romans chapter 5, I read to you in verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because 
The love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Holy Ghost sheds God's love in your heart, in my heart. Our hearts are saturated by God's love. It's not something we manufacture. It's not something we learn. It's not something we labor for. The Holy Ghost shed that love abroad in our heart. And if that love is not there, today I pray that the Holy Ghost will shed abroad God's love in your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. That's why we love. He shed that love abroad in our hearts. Do you know why, we, why God says we, we, we should love? Our love is meant to be a reciprocation of his love. What do I mean? First John chapter 4, verse 19. First John chapter 19. We love him because he first loved us. Your love is to be a reciprocation of his love. God loved you first and he says, respond to my love. And he says, reciprocate my love. He, the Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. That's why. That's why God is saying, walk in love. He has loved you. Where is your response? He has loved you. Where is your reciprocation? He has loved you. Where is your gratitude to return that love? We love him because he first loved us. You know one thing? People don't understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when you don't, you will not be able to live the Christian life correctly. The Old Testament was about justice and punishment. Look at John chapter 8. Those people that brought that woman to Jesus, they were still living in the Old Testament. John chapter 8, verse 1. John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what says that? You know why? Because the Old Testament is about justice and punishment. You are caught sinning. You must be punished. You are disobedient to your parents. They take you to the marketplace. They stone you to death. You are caught in adultery. You are stoned to death. That's the law. Justice and punishment. And these people came in that. They are not sinning. They were living in the Old Testament. And they said, well, this woman, we caught her in the very act of committing immorality. Now, we have it written in the Old Testament, in the law. Moses gave us the law that such a woman should be stoned to death. What is your opinion? But what they forgot is that New Testament is about mercy and forgiveness. You know what Jesus later told that woman? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Receive divine mercy. You are forgiven. Don't go and be committing immorality anymore. Go and live right or you are forgiven. Mercy, forgiveness. That's a major difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if, as a believer, you want to live right, you need to understand that, that the Old Testament is about justice, is about punishment, but the New Testament is about mercy, is about forgiveness. That's important. Christ brought a new commandment of love. That's why. Look at John chapter 11, chapter 13. John chapter 13. Why is it? Because Christ brought a new commandment. That's why there is a change. A change of God. A change of issues. 
a change of, you know, of priorities. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you. What was the old commandment? The old commandment says, you take that individual in adultery, you stone her to death. If a thief is caught, he must pay dearly for his theft. That was the Old Testament. That was the commandment. But Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Love is meant to be the badge of discipleship. The love we have for ourselves, the care and the compassion we have for ourselves should be what all believers used to recognize that we are believers. Say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. It's a different ball game, my brother. It's a different ball game, my sister. Lord, Jesus said, I brought a new commandment. That's why if Jesus has brought a new commandment and it's a commandment of love, that's why he says, walk in love. If you are not walking in love, then you are not a disciple of Jesus. If you are not walking in love, then you are not a true Christian. It's something else. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Towards the end of his life, the apostle wrote this to some people. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, he was not writing to sinners. He was writing to believers. Brethren, he was not writing to those who have not encountered Christ. He was writing to those who are born again. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which he had from the beginning. What is he talking about? Is he talking about from the beginning in Genesis? He was not alive at that time. He's talking about from the beginning with Jesus. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. And he said, I'm towards the end of my life. I'm writing to you, but I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but the old commandment that Jesus gave us. Jesus said, I brought a new commandment. And he said, I'm just reminding you what Jesus gave unto us. To us, it's an old commandment because Jesus already gave us. So it's of time. So he said, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which he had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which he have had from the beginning. He said, you have had it. You were there when it was preached. You were there when it was delivered. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shining. Then he says, but a new commandment I'm still writing to you. Well, it is old because we were told a few years ago. It is new because Jesus brought it afresh. It's different from the Old Testament. It is both old and new. And it was a commandment of law. And Jesus said, this commandment, that's what I give. Now, what did he say? What is that commandment? What is that commandment? Look at in verse 9. He that said is in the light and hated his brother is in darkness even until now. See, you know the commandment I'm talking about, love. If you hate your brother and you say you are in the light, say you are, you are lying, you are still in darkness even until now. Verse 10, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is no occasion for stumbling in him. Verse 11, but he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness had blinded his eyes. So I'm talking about love. Hatred cannot stay in your life. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Say, as a believer, you must love. That's the only, you, every one of your actions must be from the perspective of love. See, I'm telling you, every one of your reaction must be from the angle of love. A new commandment I, I bring. That's what Jesus said, and it's a commandment of love. We are exalted, 
exalted in the Bible as well as commanded to walk in love. Yea, to walk in Christ's love. It's an exhortation, but also is a commandment. A new commandment I bring that you love one another. It's not only an exhortation, it's also a commandment. Join the two together. Now, what does it mean to walk in Christ's love? Very simple. Walking in Christ's love excludes all hatred and all malice towards our brethren and towards other people. Here, the apostle told us and said, if you hate your brother, you are still in darkness, you are walking in darkness, and darkness has blinded your eyes. You are not in the light. You must love your brother. Look at chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. First John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. We know that we have passed from death unto life. How do we know we have passed from death unto life? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. He said, if you don't, if you hate, if you don't love, you are still in death. But we have passed from eternal death unto eternal life. How do we know we have passed from eternal life, eternal death unto eternal life? Because we love the brethren. Verse 15. We, who, whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. How do we know we have passed from death unto life? Because we love the brethren. Look at chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So you can love, you can you hate your brother, you cannot love your brother that you can see physically. How do you want to love God who you cannot even see? See, it's impossible. Verse 21. Then he said, and this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. To say you love God and you hate your brother is not consistent. He who loveth God loveth his brother also. You cannot love God and say you hate the creature of God. If you love God, you will love your brother also. Very important. So number one, walking in Christ's love excludes all hatred and all malice towards our brethren and towards other people. Whatever they do, we need to manifest love. We are not responsible for their action, but I'm responsible for my response. They hate me, they abuse me, they misrepresent me, they malign me, they blackmail me. That's, they are responsible for their action. But my response should be a response of love. I don't retaliate. I don't hate them. If I cannot help them, I leave them in their situation. But no manifestation of any malice towards them. That's important. That's what the Bible says. Walking in Christ's love excludes all hatred, excludes all malice towards our brethren or towards other people. Number two, walking in Christ's love delivers us from all sorts of fear, fear of judgment, fear of men, and so on. First John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. The Bible says, Herein is our love made perfect. And I'm asking this morning, is your love made perfect? Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Rather than fearing judgment, you are bold in the day of judgment. You know what the Bible says? The righteous is as bold as a lion. They bring you to the judgment seat. What do you have to fear? There is no iniquity in your life. There is no perverseness in your life. There is no sin in your life. So whatever judgment they want to pass, nobody can condemn you. You will have boldness in the day of judgment. Not that you'll be fearing. I hope they're not going to sentence me. What is happening? No. Bible says here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, 
but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when you walk in love, it will deliver you from all sorts of fear, fear of judgment. Even if they bring you before the judgment seat, there is no perverseness in your life. There is no iniquity in your life. There is no sin in your life. You don't have any skeleton in the cupboard. What have you got to, have to be afraid for? Nothing. If they bring you before men, what can man do unto you? You have not done anything worthy of persecution or whatever, or worthy of oppression. So there is no fear. When you walk in love, it delivers you from all sorts of fear. Fear of death. You know, death is a gateway to glory for the believer. When a believer dies and goes to the region beyond, sorrows are over, tears are over, pain is over, poverty is over, lack is over. Death is a gateway to glory. So the believer is not afraid of dying. You know, the story was told. There was a Scottish woman the Scottish woman was living in a house. She was very poor. And the house, the roof was leaking and leaking very badly. So when it is raining, all the house is wet. In water everywhere. And then somebody was asking that woman and saying, but this house you are living in, how do you feel? The woman said, when it is time to go to heaven, it will be easy to leave this place. Do you understand what she was saying? She saw it from another perspective. She said, when it is time to go, it will be very easy for me to go. But the people that have great mansions, they, they, it, it will be very difficult for them to die. They don't want to leave the mansion. You know, the woman said, when it is time to go, very easy for me, I'll be gone because I know I'm going to a better place. Perspective. She saw death as a gateway to glory. And it tells her in her Christian life, well, it's only for a time, I'm going to a better place. So the believer is not afraid. Fear of man, no. Fear of judgment, no. Fear of death, no. Fear of persecution, no. And we are going to report it to the king. Is Daniel afraid? No. Paul is once you can fall for the case, you can report him. And they reported him to the king, and the king called him. I heard you are praying. And I said, Yes, I was praying. You had right. Well, we have made a decree, we are going to send you into the lion's den. Well, so let it be. And they sent him into the lion's den. But can't you see what God did for him? God shot the mouth of the lions, they couldn't kill him. And later Daniel said, Oh God, oh, oh king, why did it I die? Because I have not sinned before you. Innocency was found in my life. So because of that, God sent his angels and blocked the mouth of the lions. So when you are living in righteousness, the righteous is as bold as a lion. Every form of fear gets out of your life. And when you live in love, that's what happens. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Show me somebody who is fearful. The person will die a thousand times before the actual physical death. Fear will grip him. Any little thing, hey, hey, maybe today. Fear. No. Number three, walking in Christ's love makes us to have compassion on our needy brethren. That's very, very important. Look at First John, where you are, chapter three, in verse fourteen. Where you, where? When you have love, when you walk in love, First John chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. In verse, uh, verse uh, 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Love will make you to sacrifice for the brethren. Love made God to sacrifice his son for us. Verse 17, look at this. But whoso at this world's good and see it his brother have meat 
and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. The question is, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He says, you have resources and you can spare some of those resources. Then you see a brother that doesn't have anything, is going without. And you can spare some of your own to help him, but you don't do so. You just leave him in his need. The Bible asks you the question, how dwells the love of God in you? It, it is not dwelling in you. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Say, so don't let your profession of love just be a profession from the mouth. Let's see it in physical action. I love my brethren. Let's see it in sacrifice for the brethren. Have compassion and help us. Physical action. Look at John chapter 11. Let me show you something. John, the gospel. You have read the story, but see how people interpreted it. Jesus could say, I love Mary, I love Martha, I love uh, Lazarus. Those are words. But look at John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. At the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept. Verse 35. That was verse 35. Verse 36. Then said the Jews, Behold how we love him. They saw the love through the action, not words. I love Mary, words. I love Martha, words. I love Lazarus, words. Don't love in word, don't love in tongue, but love in deed and love in truth. Let your action correspond with your confession. Very important. So we need to understand that that working in Christ's love makes us to have compassion on our little brethren. That's what it means to work in Christ's love. You remember where we started from? The Bible says, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk in the way of good men. This is the way of good men. Every form of hatred is excluded from their life towards other people. This is the way of good men. They don't walk in fear because love has delivered them from every sort of fear. This is the way of good men. Love makes them to have compassion on those who are needy. The people they can help, they help them. That's love. You remember the story of the Samaritan? One man fell among thorns. A priest was coming. He didn't help him. He had no love. A Levite came that way. He didn't help the man. He had no love. But the certain Samaritan came, saw the man, picked him up, sent him to an hospital, paid his bills. That's love. And Christ said, that certain Samaritan was that man's neighbor. Because the person you are capable of helping and you help, that's your neighbor. Love. And I'm praying that today, God will cause us to love. Amen. God of course ought to walk in Christ's love in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the essence of the believer's work. Number two, walking in Christ's light. You know why Christ came? John chapter 3 in verse 19. This is why Christ came into the world. He came for you. He came for me. What did he come to do? Let's see it. Verse 19, and this is a condemnation. The light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Christ brought light into the world. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Christ came bringing light. John chapter one, verse four. John chapter one, verse four. In him 
in Christ was life. And the life, what was it? Was a light of men. And the light shined in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for the witness, to bear witness of the light, and that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John the Baptist was not the light. Jesus was the light, the life of men. And John was sent to bear witness of the light. Verse 9. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. I pray that that true light will lighten you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And every form of darkness on your path will disappear because the true light now shineth and the darkness cannot comprehend it. I pray that will be your, you know, your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. This is what the Lord is telling us. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in what? In life. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Christ came so that we can move out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And if you have not done so today, I pray that today you will move out of darkness into God's marvelous light in Jesus' name. Amen. But you know, when God moves us out of darkness into his marvelous light, it's an event. Redemption is an event. Salvation is an event. But when God moves us out of darkness into his marvelous light, it's not meant to just be an event, but to be a continual process. We are brought into Christ's life so that we can continue to walk in that light for the rest of our lives. It's not that God brought you out of darkness into his light today, and then tomorrow you can go back into darkness and do whatever you like. No, once he has brought you into that light, he wants you to continue to live in that light. He wants you to continue to walk in that light. He wants you to continue to abide in that light. That's important. It's a process. It's an event that is followed by a process. Continues. In John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I read verse 12. To you. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He's still the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. As you are on the platform this morning, are you walking in darkness? Then you don't belong to Christ. You know what Christ said? If you belong truly to Christ, you will not walk in darkness, you will walk in light. Verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, whoever is a disciple of, of me, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I pray you will not walk in darkness. Amen or you will have the light of life in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 12, verse 35. John chapter 12, verse 35. Then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, let darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not Whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed 
and did hide himself from them. Christ said, you have the light, embrace the light, abide in the light, walk in the light. If you walk in darkness, you'll be stumbling. If you walk in darkness, there's no guarantee of you getting to your destination. You will miss the road. Walk in the light. That's what Jesus said. So we need to understand that, that it's not meant to be just an event. It's meant to be an event followed by a process, a continual walking in Christ's light. The believer must never walk in darkness or have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. God does not expect you to walk in darkness. If you say you are a believer, you must walk in the light. Ephesians chapter 5, I read from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 5, I read from verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You can't say you are a believer and you are still having fellowship with the fruitful works of darkness. Somebody cannot be a believer and still a member of the Oboni Fraternity Court or the Oboni Court or the Rosicrucian Amok or you have joined a particular lodge. You cannot be a believer and still be having fellowship with the fruitful works of darkness. The Bible says, rather you will reprove them. You cannot be a member of the secret society and you say you are a believer. It does not happen. You cannot be a member of a lodge. You cannot be a member of a Luboni court. And then you say you are still a believer. It's just that, uh, you know, this one doesn't matter. It matters. The Bible says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Oboni is an unfruitful work of darkness. The lodge is an unfruitful work of darkness. And you cannot be having fellowship with that. Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. That's why it's a secret society. When they are doing their initiation and they are drinking blood and they are doing this and they are making sacrifices and uh, you know making a lot of uh, a lot of uh, incantations and go. It's unfruitful work of darkness. That's why they are called secret society. And the Bible says it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. But whatsoever does make manifest is light. If you say what you are doing is not evil, then bring it to the light. Let's see it. Let it be transparent. Do it before everybody. The pastor that has a room that room is always locked. It's only you that have access to that room. Nobody must get into that room. My pastor, what are you keeping in that room? What calabash are you keeping in that room? What juju is there that nobody must see? If there is nothing hidden, your room can be open. Anybody can walk in at any time. You don't have any hidden agenda. You are transparent. So if you are locking up a place, locking it up, nobody never, nobody must ever enter. It's only you. There is something. There is something inside that place. You are walking in darkness. Open it up. Verse 14. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So the believer must never walk you know, in, in darkness and must never have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather must reprove them. Romans chapter 13. It's not just one passage of scripture that says it. Many, many passages of scripture says that. So as a believer, you cannot be doing things that are shady, things that are secret. Romans chapter 13, verse, in verse 14. Romans chapter 13, in verse 14. What does the scripture say? It says, in fact, let, let me read from, uh, let me already read from even verse 12. Romans chapter 13 from verse 12. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. 
Let us cast off the works of darkness. Can you see what it says? Cast off the works of darkness. Don't have anything to do with it. Cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on, what are you to put on? The armor of light. Cast off the works of darkness. Cast off the regalia of the occult. Cast off the regalia of the body. And put on the robe of righteousness. And put on the armor of light. Verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the Lord's thereof. Cast off the works of darkness and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the Lord's thereof. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Because I need to read all this to you. Walking in Christ's light. And I'm asking you this morning, are you walking in Christ's light, my brother? Are you walking in Christ's light, my sister? First Thessalonians chapter 5, I read to you from verse 5. It says, we are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night. We are not of darkness. I am not a, I'm not a child of the darkness. I'm not a child of the night. I'm a child of the day. And I'm a child of light. And I believe that you also, you are not a child of the, of the night. You are not a child of darkness. You are a child of the day. You are a child. You know, thieves, thieves operate in the night. Prostitutes operate many times in the night. All those shady things, they operate in the night, but we are the day. They operate in darkness, but we are the light. You know, that's why when you go to red light district, everything is dark. You are almost not able to, you know, to, to, to see the face of somebody. Red light and all these things and go disco light, because those are, those are things. In verse seven, verse six, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 7, for they that sleep, they sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, they are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Put it on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an element, the hope of salvation. Do away with drunkenness. Do away with evil. Do away with activities of the night. That's why the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. What have you got to do with idols? What have you got to do with unequal yoke with all believers? The believer doesn't have that. First John chapter one. Let's say first John. First John chapter one, in verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Show me somebody that says, I know Jesus, but he's walking in darkness. The Bible says, you are lying. You are not doing the truth. You say, you know, I'm born again and I love God, but we can see boyfriend, girlfriend relationship in your life. You lie and you do not the truth. And we are not doing anything. We are just boyfriend, girl. The things you do when nobody is there, can you do it when everybody is there? Say, what people will talk. It means that those things are not decent. Those things are not normal. Those things are not expected. Whatever you do together in secret that you cannot do openly, that tells you already that that thing is questionable, is seen. And the Bible says in verses, if we say that we have fellowship with Jesus, and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But look at verse seven. For if we walk in the light, walking in the light, walking in the light, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ is son cleanseth us from all sin. You need to walk in the light. And you know what it means to walk in the light? To walk in the truth. Third John verse 4. The Bible says, I have no greater joy 
that to hear that my children walk in truth. It is the word of God that brings light. And when you walk in the word, you walk in truth, you are walking in the light. So very, very important. The believer must never walk in darkness or have anything to do with the fruitful works of darkness. The believer must always walk in the light. What do we do? The believer must never walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That's where we started from. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Our time is on. But you know the story. Amnon wanted to rape Tamar. And Tamar was half sister because David was their father, but they have two, two different mothers. So Amnon was from one mother, Tamar was from another mother, but both of them were the children of David. And Amnon wanted to rape Tamar. And had a, a friend, Jonadab. And Jonadab said, is that what you want to do? I'll give you the strategy. It's not that difficult. And eventually, uh, 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 um, uh, he gave Amnon, the, Jonathan gave Amnon the strategy. That's how Amnon raped them. But eventually, Absalom killed him two years later. You know why? Amnon walked in the council of the ungodly, perished. My brother, if you are walking in the council of the ungodly, you are likely to perish. You are married, but at your place of work, a man will be telling you, yeah, I'm also married now, but how can I leave all these chicks? You see their boobs, you see their bum, I'm all set. And he's counseling you to get into sin. You are digging your grave. Like I'm not perished, you will perish. I'm not perished because he walked in the counsel of the ungodly. Jonathan was ungodly. Gave Amnon an ungodly advice. Amnon followed that advice. He died an untimely death. He perished. He grew up one. after Solomon died. He grew up and was going to be the next king in 1 Kings chapter 12. And then the people came to him and they said, You know, your father was too oppressed. The bodies were, the taxes were too many. He, he ruled with an iron heart. We want to serve you, new king, but please reduce this our body. You know, be compassionate towards us. He told them to go and in three days' time to call. You know what happened? He listened to the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly youths like him, they told him, Is that what the people said? And you need to tell them that my father beat you with a stick, I will, I will chastise you with a, with a scorpion. My father only beat you with one hand. Ah, I'm going to beat you with a beam. When they came three days later and they, and they heard what the king said, they said to your tent, to Israel, that's how the kingdom, you know, scattered over him. You know why? He listened to the counsel of the ungodly. So King Rehoboam, he walked in the counsel of the ungodly and he lost a significant part of his kingdom. When the Bible says, that blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You are hearing this morning. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Somebody is telling you error. Somebody is telling you lies. You don't want to obey the, the light. You don't want, you want to walk in darkness. You don't want to obey the truth. We give you the scriptures. They tell you, well, that one is old passion. You are digging your grave. You will lose significant things in your life. You will perish. The only person that will be blessed is the person that does not you know, walk in the counsel of the ungodly. I pray that today you will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And if that ungodly person does not want to change, cut him off. He cannot be your friend. Some of you are here today, especially those of you who are students. I've told you a story like that. I still remember the name of it, of, of, of that boy, Shegu, who were growing up together, who were living in the same house. We were friends. But you know the day the friendship ended, the day Shegu told me, come and see something, come and see something. And you know, like boys, you want to, you want to be curious. What is it, what is it, what, what is it he wants to show me? You know the house where we lived, 
was a house where the bathroom was made of planks, you know, wooden planks. So there are, so, you know, the planks, there's no way you can make the planks to be completely covered. So there were holes in the planks. And Shegun would go to the back of the house. Through those black planks, would be looking at the nakedness of women when they were bathing. And every woman in that house, Shegun had looked at their nakedness as they were bathing in that bathroom. And that was what he told me to come and watch that day. But you know, when I saw it, I felt so bad. I wasn't even born again at that time. I wasn't born again. And I asked Shegun, is this what you do? He said, yes. That was the last day I said, you cannot be my friend. You cannot be my friend. Look at what he's trying to introduce me to. To come and be looking at the nakedness of women when they are bathing through the crack in the, in the wall. But even though we were living in the same house, that was the last day that Shegun was my friend. Don't work in the counsel of the ungodly. Is it me that even when I was an unbeliever, I will not work in the counsel of the ungodly. Then I become a believer. Then you tell me I will work. No, 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 no. Well, my life is what it is today. I got married 1991. By the grace of God, this is 2023. This is 32 years. I've never looked right. I've never looked left. No matter any woman, no matter how educated, no matter how beautiful, no matter how rich, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. No look right. But you know, if I followed Shegun's advice and my mind, every time I'm seeing the nakedness of women, how will I be faithful? I can't be a faithful husband because my mind would have been polluted. Every single woman that I see, I must think about it. But that's what is happening. Those of you that you are listening to the counsel of the ungodly and you are working in the counsel of the ungodly, it's going to affect your life. You can't live right. I pray that the Lord Himself He will help you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last point: We must walk in Christ's love. What does that mean? So many believers they have misunderstood the concept of the law. You know what they said? They said we are no longer under the law, but under grace. Yes, we are under grace. And what they say? They they, they say that you know the law has been abolished. Yes. And no, the old covenant has been abolished. The old covenant has been replaced by the new covenant. But the principles of the old, old covenant, those principles abide. Those principles are binding on us. Do you see the old, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not steal. In the New Testament, is stealing. Is still it okay? No. But the Bible says, he that stole before, let him steal no more. No. The principle is still, even though the old covenant has been abolished, but the moral code is still there. Covetousness, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. In the, in the New Testament, don't you see what Christ said? Covetousness was condemned. In the, in the Old Testament, the Bible says, Honor your father and your mother, otherwise you are cursed. Don't you see Ephesians chapter 6? Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Provoke not your, you know, honor your father and your mother. It's in the New Testament. The moral code is still there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Look at it. Christ did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. So we have to walk in Christ's law. Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, pass, one church or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Christ, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. 
The ritual aspects of the law might not be relevant. Yes, we don't go now, we want to pray. First of all, wash our hand, wash it onto the, you know, from, from here onto our elbow. Well, that was Old Testament, ritual worship, before worship. That one is not relevant today. The ritual aspects of the law, I'm not going to take a goat and kill it and shed its blood today. Jesus has already shed the blood for me. The ritual aspects of the law, they are abandoned. They are not relevant for the moral code. For the moral code of the law, they are abiding. Stealing is still wrong. Covetousness is still wrong. Adultery is still wrong. Bearing false witness is still wrong. They are all still sins, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. They are sins. The Mosaic law, look at Galatians chapter 5. Sorry, Galatians chapter 3. Then what is the purpose of the law? Ah, there is a purpose, a great purpose. What is the purpose of the law? Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. That's the purpose of the law. The law was our schoolmaster. And that law brought us to a new master. It says, I've been your schoolmaster up till now, but I'm handing you over to a new master. And you think that the new master has no law? You think that the new master is uh, just liberal? The new master doesn't care what you do? Of course not. Of course not. Look at Galatians chapter 6. That's it, chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 2. See what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 6. The schoolmaster has brought you unto Christ. Galatians chapter 6. Bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill. What did he say? The law of Christ. The law of Christ. There is a law of Christ, my brother, and you must fulfill the law of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. You must walk in the law of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. To them that are without law, as without law. Be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Paul said, I did as sin, I was without law, but truly I'm under the law to Christ. There is a law of Christ, and we need to understand that. After two, when you read Matthew chapter 5, you know what Jesus said? It has been said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was the Old Testament law. But I say unto you, if you look on the woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery in your hand. That's a new commandment. That's a new law. He said, before they will tell you, you can swear. But I say unto you, swear not by heaven, it is God's truth. Swear not by the earth, it is his foot's truth. Swear not by even a tread of your ear, because you cannot make any. That's a new commandment. It's important. That's the law of Christ. So we are now under the law of Christ. Being a believer does not leave us without the law, but empowers us with grace to fulfill the law and to live uprightly. We are to walk in Christ's law. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. What did he say? If look at look at John chapter 14. Some people say Christ does not have any law. Ah, you are not reading your Bible well. It means that you are listening to the wrong voice. It means that you are reading the Bible upside down. John chapter 14, verse 15. If he loved me, what did he say? Keep my commandment. What is the commandment? Law. Oh, yeah. If you love me, keep my commandment. Does he have law? Of course. Does he have commandments? Yes. If you love me, keep my commandments. We need to understand that the believer, we are to walk in Christ's law. We are not walking in the Mosaic law. We are not walking in the law of the Old Testament. Christ has a higher law by, by which we are to walk. In the, in the Old Testament, adultery was a physical act. In the New Testament, nothing after a woman. We are, the woman doesn't even know. Nobody even knows that you are not after that woman. But Christ said you have already committed adultery. The standard is higher, much higher. 
And we are to walk in Christ's love. So if you are a believer, this is what you must do. The believer's work. That's what we are talking about today. The believer's work. The believer does not work in the counsel of the ungodly, but the believer must work in the way of good men. The believer must work in Christ's love. The believer must work in Christ's life. The believer must work in Christ's love. And I'm asking you today, are you working in Christ's love? Are you working in Christ's light? Are you working in Christ's love? Let's rise up and pray. Thank you, Let's rise up and pray. Will you tell the Lord for me today? The believer's work. How is your work? Office. How is your work, my brother? How is your work, my sister? Are you working right? Is it well with your soul? Did Christ come today? Will you go? Is it well with you? Is your work a crooked work? Are you working in the council of the ungodly? Those of you that you are in the school, we have talked, you have talked and talked and told you, we have preached, we have done, we have counseled. But if I get that relationship is bad, you want to do it. You, you want to live right. But you have ungodly friends that are telling you there's a way you will do it. You will do it. No, you will be smart about it. What are you being smart about? What are you being smart about? And you are working in the council of the ungodly. Yeah, God, everybody does it. Yeah, yeah, this people, their own is too much. And God is talking to you this morning. Oh, and you are working in the council of the ungodly. You came from a good home. The pastor must not hear. The pastor must not hear. The people that know you, you that you be involved in that kind of relationship. But you are. But God is telling you today, you are working in the council of the ungodly. Walk not in the council of the ungodly. Terminate it today. Of the works of darkness. Terminate that evil work. Terminate that evil counsel. If the person has nothing more for you, then cut yourself off. I told you I cut myself off from shedding. I cut myself off. Today I can be changed. That's why today I, can, I don't I don't go after after well, women. Yes, That's why today my yes. mind is not polluted. Just stop the works of darkness. Like I said, Reprove them. So have no fellowship with your fruitful works of darkness. Reprove them. What you have taught us, Lord God, we walk to in Christ's love. In the name of Jesus. No hatred. Let us walk in Christ. No malice. Let Almighty God help me, help me, help me. Let love cast out fear out of your life. Let your love be one of you know, practical deeds. Not just mouth talk. Walk in Christ's light. Don't walk in darkness. Walk in the truth. In the mighty name of Jesus. And walk in the law of Christ. The believer is not lawless because grace has come. Grace empowers us to fulfill the law. Grace empowers us to live right. Grace empowers us to be what God wants us to be. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of this new series on the believer's life. And we're praying that every one of us will put our Christian life and weigh ourselves in the balance to see if we are still wanting. And in any area where we are wanting, oh God, help us to make amends in Jesus' name. Amen. And none of us, we will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. I'm not who walked in the counsel of the ungodly, he perished. Rehoboam walked in the counsel of the ungodly, he lost a significant part of his kingdom. Oh, the outcome is always bad. We want to walk in the way of good men. We want to walk in the way of good women. We want to walk in the way of good boys. We want to walk in the way of good, good girls. Oh God, 
empower us to walk in the way of good people in Jesus' name. Amen. Empower us to walk in Christ's love. Empower us to walk in Christ's light. Empower us to walk in Christ's love. Empower us to live as you have designed. That our, our life will be truly a believing life in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody with any kind of weakness, any kind of hindrance, oh Lord, I pray, the power of the Holy Ghost will blow that weakness and blow that compromise out of their life in Jesus' name. Amen. Empower everybody for righteous living. Enable us to cut off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. To put on the breastplate of faith and love. To put on, oh Lord, the breastplate of righteousness. Do it in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.